Okay, everyone. So I think I'll um, make a start. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. housekeeping. Oh, I can hear myself. Good sign, good sign. There's some <laughs> um, swing. Is there a bounce? There's some background noise, noise like. Uh, yeah. Is that, I think it's okay now. Yeah. Yeah, just a little bit of back, uh, housekeeping first. Um, as you'll know, we'll be recording this and then we'll put it on our, our YouTube playlist uh, later, uh, shortly after. If everyone could keep their microphones off um, and also uh, their videos off, uh, that would help us to uh, focus on the speaker and the presentation. Um, and we'll have questions, but we'll leave those till the end so that we can sort of uh, make sure we just keep the flow of the flow of the chat. So uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Stephen Haven. I'm a data science consultant here at the Energy Systems Catapult. I'm very happy to uh, introduce you to another Value in Energy Data Seminar. And very pleased to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Rafael Veron. Um, so a little bit of uh, his bio before we, we introduce the talk. He's a professor of management science and head of the Department of Operations Research and Business Intelligence at the Roxwell University of Science and Technology. He's one of the leading world's experts on energy forecasting and is periodically engaged as a consultant to financial engineering, energy and software engineering companies. Um, there's a lot more details on his website. I'll share that in the chat later. Um, but yeah, I'm very pleased to introduce today's talk, which is going to be on recent advances in electricity price forecasting. So yeah, please take it away, Rafa. OK, uh, thanks. Thanks, Stephen, for, for introducing me. Thanks for inviting. Uh, welcome, everyone. Let me share my screen and start the talk. Mm -hmm. This should work. You should be seeing all my slides now. Uh, OK, uh, so I'll be talking about uh, recent advances. All, I mean, essentially what, what, what has been going on electricity, in electricity price forecasting uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the work, as usual, is based uh, on papers uh, with my colleagues. So most of them are listed listed here. Uh, let me just quickly change one thing because for some reason, OK. Uh, OK, so most of them are listed here. So these are either my former PhD students, uh, former students. Uh, some of them are still uh, currently working with me. And uh, as usual, uh, it's it's not just the, it's not just the leader that should take the credit, but also the the army of PhD students behind him that actually do the do the hard job. So uh, yeah, that that that's it. And uh, if we are talking about price for electricity price forecasting, well, we should put it in perspective. So this is um, an updated uh, um, graph showing the number of papers on energy forecasting of the four four different uh, areas of of uh, of uh, forecasting. And you, as you can see, I mean, this is an updated version of from a from a from a graph we had in our review in 2020. Back then it wasn't, we had the view until 2019, the, the last, well, three and almost four years uh, are the update. And as you can see, the, the number of papers is constantly growing. Uh, so in the in a matter of 12 years, it has gone from something like 600 to over 3000. So uh, that's, uh, that's, really, that's really a lot. But of course there are different sub areas which are which are more uh, researched or pub papers are published on this than, than, than others. So historically it was the, at least by, by 2010, it was already load forecasting and wind forecasting, which were which were kind of popular. Solar picked up um, later, of course, with, with now everyone, almost everyone having a, a panels or PV panels on the rooftops, this has become much more research. However, my area is the red one here. So it's uh, compared to the other to the three other areas, it's definitely the least uh, you can find uh, the lowest number of papers you can find on this topic. Still, it has been growing. It has been growing over the years, and uh, it's uh, it's it's quite an active quite an active area. And of course, it's it's a very nice area because because this is uh, what I'm doing. So definitely, that's the good reason for it. Now, looking at the a publication outlet. So, if you are looking for for different uh, publication outlets of uh, of energy forecasting papers, then um, well, here is again an updated version of of the of the plot that was in our 2020 review. Uh, uh, this covers the years from 2010 to uh, well to today essentially, 
Uh, and you can see the percentage of forecasting papers. These are the forecasting papers uh, in, in the four areas. The top 10 journals with the highest number of publications in each of the areas is included here. Of course, some are ranked in the top 10 across multiple areas. And what you can see is uh, there are uh, some journals are really into energy forecasting in general. Uh, like the top three here, you see between five and seven percent of publications in these journals are uh, actually on forecasting. Uh, whereas some are more general journals and, and they have uh, the, the percentage, although even, even though some like the numbers of some of the journals, so these are the numbers here, this is the total number of papers published in these 13 years, 14 years, this is this is the number of energy forecasting papers. Uh, some of these journals publish really a lot, but compared to, to the thousands of, uh, of other non-forecasting publications, the, uh, the share is much smaller. And of course, you can see that also just some, some uh, journals we specialize in, in certain areas, for instance, wind energy is differently into wind energy, that's logical. Solar energy is into solar. And when looking at forecasting, uh, it's it's international journal of forecasting, which is the, the leading journal of, in, in the forecast area of forecasting in general. So also in energy forecasting, it doesn't publish that many papers a year, but uh, really they, they are really worth uh, looking into. Uh, and there also in energy forecasting, there is uh, there is a, a kind of also another journal which is energy economics, which also focuses uh, on on uh, on price forecasting not so much on the other four areas. OK, so that's that's the general overview. So I'll be talking about the red bars, not about not about the yellow, green and, and gray, which of course are also very important and, and interesting. Some of the methods are, can be used that we use them are similar. Some of them has to have to be tailor made for for the for price forecasting. Now, when talking about electricity price forecasting, uh, it is primarily the day that the, the auction day ahead auction that is that is uh, studied. So the day ahead auction where where a day before you bid into the exchange, there's the, uh, uh, then you have around midday you have you have the US you um, you have the aggregated supply and demand uh, demand uh, bits and, and the curves and the intersection gives you the price. You do it for each of the load periods for the next day. The most common setup is you have it for 24 hours of the next day. So I would say more than 90% of the papers is in this area. There are very, very few papers on longer term forecasting, which is a pity, and I'll come back to it later. And there are some papers on intraday markets, uh, real time markets, as they are called in the US, uh, uh, pure on balancing. So these are becoming more popular also with, with the introduction of the exhibit uh, scheme in, in, in Europe. Uh, the intraday continuous time intraday markets are, are much more popular. And the trading here is uh, from a certain afternoon hour on day D minus two. There's continuous trading until a few minutes typically uh, before the, the load period starts. So if we are looking at hourly products, uh, then you have a trading for the hours until just before midnight. And for the last product, it's trading almost until the midnight of the next day. So that's uh, that's that's how these and of course the the models developed for these two classes of of um, um, of markets uh, are are very different. Uh, and I'll be talking about those uh, as well. Now, uh, after this brief introduction, let me tell you okay what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll give you an overview of what was the model evolution, and how this has changed over the years. Uh, a bit on calibration windows. Then we'll talk about something more than point forecasts. So this will be publishing and path forecasting. And fin uh, finally, about financial evaluation of the forecasting models, which is uh, not still not a common uh, thing to do, but it's becoming more and more common. Now, uh, on the right hand side, you see three of my review publications. The first one, uh, the 2014, is general about electricity price forecasting. Uh, the 2018 was was about probabilistic forecasting, so uh, forecasting the prediction intervals, the distributions. Um, the last one here, listed here at least, uh, is uh, about mostly about deep learning, so the the new advances in in this area. So these are the topics I'll be covering, and from a modeler's perspective, 
you, I mean, the day ahead market, you can look at it as a series of, say, if you have the, if you have uh, hourly prices, so that's that's the most common setup, especially in the day ahead markets. You have hourly prices. You can think of it of, as one long time series. Uh, when you see, see here, these are the, the values for one particular day, uh, and you can think of a build, built in model which uses these past data and makes a forecast for the, for this day. Then using moves on and makes a forecast for the next day, moves on and makes a forecast for the for the for, sorry, for the next hour and so on. So so this is a way we call this typically univariate, so you can kind of a, a, a one series, the price series at least, uh, that, that is, you treat it as one series. But you can also look at it that the 24 hourly products are different series, um, and this is more of a multivariate setting where you treat, this is the series for hour one, hour two, uh, then we go hour nine, here hour 24, and, you, when, and we have this is your primary area of interest when you are forecasting the price for hour one of a given day. But of course, you can use information about prices from other hours of the day. Uh, so it just doesn't have to be limited, but you build a model that outputs uh, hour one. Uh, then you may build a separate, separate model for, for outputting hour two and so on. And this is, if you look at the literature, this is a more common approach. Uh, also, because it's a bit uh, slightly, these models are slightly more parsimonious uh, in how they are structured. So, so it's so so you have a, m a bit more control of what what you are doing. However, both approaches, as we showed in uh, our our paper with with Florian, 2018, they almost give it this. I and mean, you can you can even transform one one model from one version to the second one, and essentially you get the same, almost the same results. Uh, but this is not the end. You, there are some interesting concepts out there and one is to use functional or data functional data analysis and think about the evolution of functions in a functional space not evolution of prices for particular hours like points on a curve but the whole curve uh, and of course while this is really tempting from a mathematical point of view the f the results that have been published so far and i believe these are the only three papers that really that really, that really uh, treat this topic uh, they are not really, uh, they can't beat some other uh, some other uh, models out there. So they are a very nice concept, but still still there's a lot of, a lot of space for development in, in this area. A different line of thinking goes into this direction where uh, we do not just predict this 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 intersection of the demand and, and supply curves, uh, for a particular load period, but where we um, predict the whole curve, so the so the supply and demand curves, and then of course by the intersection, looking at the intersection, we get the the uh, the price itself. However, this this type of modeling allows us to use some fundamentals on how the supply stack, for instance, is structured, uh, and. Uh, as uh, Thiel and uh, Steiner have shown in an interesting paper, uh, this can be competitive. Looking looking at the um, at, uh, at at the results that, that you can get, so you can so you can get interesting results with this 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 type of uh, bidding, where you use some fundamental information on how the supply stack is structured here. Of course, you have to make some assumptions depending on the number of assumptions. You get a better fit of the of the intersection or 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 a worse one, but this is this is uh, something that is uh, also worth looking at. One of the models there, uh, it's the it's Florence paper, this X X wing uh, paper, which you may have may have already seen. Uh, okay, now if we are into modeling the price itself. Uh, so the point, not the not the whole curves, but the, the intersection of those two, of those two curves. Um, then we, whether we are working with a with, within a neural net type setting or a, or a statistical setting, this is a regression problem. So we are essentially trying to model the price for our d, uh, sorry, day d and our h, using information on. The price for the same hour, in the in the very simple case, for the same hour, a day before, two days before, a week before, 
uh, some exogenous variables, which are quite often available in the market. So this can be, uh, for instance, uh, load forecast or renewable generation or wind, solar, depending on the country, uh, that you can you can add these these values. Of course, they have to be forecasts which are available at the time you make the prediction. So like the if it's about the day ahead market, it has to be for noon uh, on the day before. Uh, it, quite often the models use some kind of an what uh, seasonal structure and this if it's uh, if it's a, about the the um, weekly seasonality uh well we don't we don't need the intraday because this is a model for a particular hour so in, in a sense we are already here we have an embedded uh, intraday structure uh, but if we want to model the the, week, uh, the weekly structure quite common approach is to use uh, to use uh, daily dummies although you can use for instance uh, fully decomposition sine waves that is also also possible um, okay but of course you have this written in a classical in a classical uh, regression or statistical setup let's say but of course you can do the same and present it as a, as a neural net without any hidden layers so the regression which was on the previous slide essentially is just um, a, a neural net without any uh, hidden layers, and this this has been the the majority of of models in the early, I mean the late nineties, early two thousands. Uh, I mean the, this this has been the, the the major area of research back then. Uh, people, of course, have tried using relatively shallow I mean shallow uh, networks, meaning with one hidden layer here. Uh, but the results were comparable to regression models, so there was not a huge improvement of using the uh, relatively simple neural nets uh, compared to uh, compared to regression models uh, until changes came. And if you are interested in the evolution of of, of these models, this is this is a reference to to our another review article on on uh, on exactly on the on this on this topic. Now. A kind of a next step in the evolution in the evolution of our models was regularization. So the concept of regularization is uh, the, it, it, I mean the, the idea behind it is uh, to kind of automatically or semi-automatically uh, eliminate some of the less important variables and leave in your model only the right ones because if you go if you go back here this model you can you can call it we even call it in some papers expert expert models because uh, we have an expert says that says okay is the price yesterday two days ago and seven days ago that is important but perhaps you should add to your model some other variables and there are a lot of possibilities this can this can be prices for different hours, for hours different uh, than than age, so let's say age plus one, for instance, and age minus one. But this can be <clears throat> also all, all other kinds of uh, variables. Now, if you put them all into a, a regression type model, also even to a neural net, without any regularization, you may have problems with 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 the convergence of the model, with 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 it really working in a general. I mean, if it was generalizing the uh the uh the problem because you want a model that is able to predict a behavior which has it has not seen so far so uh this is this is what we are this is what we, what, what, we are, what we are looking for so putting in all, all these variables into a regression model is not or neural net without without eliminating some of the variables is not not the best idea but one of the one of the methods that that work very well within within autoregressive models uh, is is lasso. Lasso is a technique uh, which which is what it does. It adds a penalty when you are computing the uh, a regression model. Typically, you minimize some error. In, in a regression, you min you minimize the true value minus the forecast squared. Well, you sum it over, and essentially, this is what you are. You are uh, you are uh, minimizing. So you are looking for such betas, the parameters of your model, such that they minimize the, uh, this, this, these sum of squared errors. Now, by adding this penalty, and you can, of course, add different kinds of penalties. This, this is just uh, the most one of the most popular ones. Um, you introduce some extra um, value if the betas are too large. 
uh, the absolute values of eta are too large. So what the model does, it actually eliminates some of the variables and uh, you can plug into the model these gray squares in, in this in this plot. They identify the full vector. So like the PD1 is the PD1 for hour one and all the way to PD1. So the previous day, hour 24. So you input the whole vector here of prices for the for the last day. Um, and using this method, you can you can get an and uh, 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 you can get the, the importance of the particular variables. Let's 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 have a look in a close up. For instance, here looking, we are predicting price for day D uh, at hour 18, and we are looking at variable which is called here X1. So this is the yesterday's load forecast for today. Uh, and what would be expected? These these are the today's this is today's prices. So what we are plotting here. This is the the price for our eighteen, and as expected, on the diagonal you see you see green squares. Green meaning these these values are these variables are more likely to appear in the model. Uh, gray light gray meaning less, and dark gray meaning they are, they almost never appear in the model. So the diagonal is rather green, and the, and the, and the particular uh, forecast for our 18, the load forecast, comes up in the model very often, which is to be expected. Uh, but surprisingly, at least when we first saw the results, was that also adding uh, the morning hour load forecast, like 8, 9, 10, and then late late uh, late hours of the day, uh, like after 10, 10 p.m. and 10 p.m. and later, would improve the forecast much more. So. Uh, Without this kind of automatic automatic uh, variable selection, it's difficult to find the the right the right uh, variables, uh, and uh, you need a lot of expert knowledge. And sometimes you even can't can't come up with uh, with an idea which variable would be really 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 good to have in a model. Uh, so these kind of models that that use regularization, which can also be in, in the neural net setting, they they uh, they are really an improvement in in, in this context. Now, uh, of course, what 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 is really interesting uh, when you look at neural net network architectures is that they can relatively easily output a whole vector of uh, prices. So let's say the prices for all twenty four hours of the next day. Uh, Without much problem, of course, uh, my problem meaning that compared to vector autoregressive models, which are the vector type uh, counterparts, uh, they have serious problems with um, with modeling the the uh, the price and get and getting giving us the, the good quality forecast. Whereas the neural nets are able to to do it to do it in such a way that the the forecasts obtained are competitive. Now, uh, introducing uh, more layers uh, allows us to to go to to represent better them the nonlinear relationships and to actually uh, provide an edge over 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 let's say lasso estimated models. So if we uh, if we would like to compare um, those two approaches, this is what we have done in our uh, review in 2021 in applied energy. We have looked at I mean, at a few classes of models, but in particular, we have looked at Lear, which is uh, Lear, which is lasso estimated, lasso estimated AR model, and uh, a deep neural net, deep neural net with two hidden layers. So it's not a really very deep, but but kind of a, one of the simplest neural nets you can have. So it's more like this architecture. Uh, where we would have a deep neural net, even even it was a fit forward, so without this this uh, links to the previous to the previous levels, um, and comparing it across uh, in this paper across five different markets, uh, uh, what we are plotting here is the relative MAE, so the relative mean absolute error, uh, meaning that if we have a value of 0.5, so this smallest circle at this level, this means that the Error of a given model, either this last estimated autoregressive model or the DNN, it's the error is half smaller than uh, 
then a naive a naive forecast uh, in this a naive meaning like the the hours the same hour for the for on the previous day so uh, in this context you can see of course that, that these models are much better than naive which is which is good otherwise it would be really really bad but then that also the the green sir uh, the green patch is within the gray one meaning that for every market the DNN was better, sometimes a bit more, sometimes a bit less uh, than than the last estimated ultra-aggressive model. So last is great if you like statistical models. So it's, uh, it's something you should look and go into, but you can get a bit better results with uh, with with deep neural nets. And this is this is the, the takeaway message from 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 this from this paper. Uh, we've also published uh, on GitHub. Uh, the codes for for these in, in Python, so you can have a look at them any moment. The toolbox is called EPF toolbox, and uh, yeah, you, you can you can play around with this code yourself. So of course you can you can increase the complexity of the models. It's not a big issue. The problem is the more complex the model is, the more parameters it has, uh, the more uh, the more these parameters have to be tuned. And this is critical in in in, in these models. Uh, okay, uh, another uh, another let's say step of of uh, trying to work with with neural net model was is a paper where we introduced the n bits x architecture x for adding an exogenous variable into the n bits model, uh, which is which is really important for uh, for energy forecasting uh, and. Uh, the model it has a much more complex architecture, uh, so it's it takes longer to 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 to, to estimate than than than, uh, than the deep neural net I was talking about uh, before, uh, but and the, and the results are more or less similar, but it allows for partial interpretation. So you can see which parts of the network can uh, represent uh, some some models, so like the the trend part. The this is 90 part and the exogenous variable. So you can have partial interpretability of of your results, but not a full one. I mean, you going deeper into the structure, you see a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, still connections, weights, which you do not really understand what is happening there. But at the higher level, you see which part of the network is doing what. And that's interesting. That goes in the direction of explainable AI. Um, of course, we are not there yet, but this is this is uh, one step forward. Um, okay, uh, let me move on to 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 uh, the remaining topics I wanted to talk about. One of these things is is cal averaging or calibrating uh, across calibration windows, and this is a really simple technique. Oh, I'm not sure when, why it's blinking on my screen, but. Uh, uh, Strange. Okay. Anyway, the idea here is that uh, that you do, when when you make when to make a forecast in a test window, it's uh, you don't know what how much data from the past you should use. So there are papers which use only a few years of data, and uh, I mean a few days of data up to up to a few years of data. So the the, the discrepancy is huge, and of course the shorter shorter windows would would be would give you a model which uh, reacts faster to, uh, to to changes in the market conditions, whereas a longer window gives you uh, more data to train your model on. So, so in this sense, it's more stable in a statistical sense. Now, what, what you can do, we can use averaging or combining as a method to improve it. And uh, the idea goes back to the goes back to the 1960s uh, and uh, to the works of yeah, Bates, Crane, Crotty, Granger, Clyde Granger, the Nobel Prize, 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 Prize laureate. Uh, it what it does, you take you take forecasts from n models, and these n models can be it can be the same model but calibrated on different windows. Let's take take a ten day window here. Let's take uh, I don't know twenty day, and let's take a six year window. After estimating the weights, and this, in the simplest case, the weights can be just one over n, and uh, this is a quite robust choice and uh, safe one. It usually works well. Uh, you get a combined forecast, and this uh, surprisingly really improves 
the forecast a lot. Now in this these two plots here, uh, we have we have individual dots or individual errors MAEs of the for a given calibration with 182 days. This is the error for two years. This is the error. But if you take averages uh, either of all, this is the green, the yellow line, or of few long windows and a few short ones, uh, you you get errors which are much lower than any of the blue dots. So this means that typically using uh, windows uh, on the short end and and the long end, and running your models on those on those models, getting the forecast and taking even the simple arithmetic average of those forecasts can give you a much better result than than just trying to to find the optimal calibration window. Uh, okay, this are this was about point forecast, and most of the studies were about point forecast. However, uh, we have uh, uh, there's there's more that can be done, and one of the things is we can go probabilistic, meaning we we can we can uh, provide interval forecast on prediction intervals or the density, the distributions of the of the whole curves. So to illustrate it, instead of looking, we start we are starting here at T0, this is the current price. Instead of giving you just value, this white, this let's say this the mean of the uh, of the of the of this random variable at, at some later times, uh, we can we can look at the whole distributions at different different time moments. Now the idea of course is we want you want them to be reliable. So if you have a 90% prediction interval, you want 90% of the observations actually to fall into this prediction interval, not more and not less. And you would like to maximize sharpness. Sharpness meaning the the width of the interval or the width of the of the of the density. So you want concentrated. You would like to have very concentrated predictions which are reliable. So which give which give the good the good the good good, good coverage uh, of the actual data. Uh, now the problem with measuring whether our model gives a good probabilistic prediction is that we are not observing the true distributions of prices in the at future time moments in time, but we are just observing the realizations of single values. And the question is, how can we compare a distribution with a single value? And here you have different scoring rules. One of them is the pinball score, also called quantile score, lin lin by linear newsboy. Uh, so which which uh, uses uh, this kind of uh, this this formula here? So it's a, the difference between uh, between the prediction of a given quantile. So let's say if, if you have a if you have a ninety percent prediction interval, then you would probably want you you would like to 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 find out what is the five five percent quantile and what is the ninety five percent quantile, because between this you you have ninety percent of uh, probability of observing the the true value. So so you could run here for the ninety fifth and the fifth quantile here, uh, and y t is your actual observation. And this function, when you plot it, looks as in in this here. So for the median, for the for q equal 15%, you have a symmetric kind of V-shaped, like absolute value function, more or less. Uh, for uh, when you when you go when you decrease the level, so so we go to five percent, you you tilt this in one direction. When you go to 95, you tilt it in the other direction, meaning that the penalty for exceeding a low quantile here. Let's say at this level by one, uh, this is the penalty when you exceed it uh, by uh, the slow quantile. But whereas exceeding by a value of one, uh, so this difference being being one, um, the fifty percent quantile is the error is only the, the penalty is only this one. So it penalizes heavier if you exceed if you observe the true observations exceed the the lower or the very high or the very high quantiles. Now. So this is the pinball score. Uh, you can aggregate it across all time moments in the test period, and you, you can also ac across all quantiles. And this in the limit gives you something which is called the continuous ranked probability score, so the CRPS, but only in the limit. And this is quite often in the papers that people, people call uh, just the pinball score over two 
quantiles, like CRPS. Well, it's not a CRPS. It's just the, the pinball score for two quantiles. The CRPS, you, you quite often you can approximate it by 99 percentiles. Uh, so from one percent to ninety nine percent, and then this is a rather good approximation of the whole of the whole distribution. But just taking two quantiles is not not good enough. Okay. Now, uh, using this quantile regression, we can get into we can get interesting uh, results. So we can from point forecast from uh, so you have models which give you point forecast. Now, using quantile regression, you can obtain the predicted quantiles. If you run it twice, for instance, for five and ninety-five percent, you you get the ninety percent prediction idea. This this was this was our idea uh, around 2013-14, and we use it in, in the global energy forecasting competition in 2014. The price track and this, this turned out very good. Actually, the top two teams use 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 the method. Now, of course, this is not the only method quantile regression, but it's one of the techniques um, you could say for post-processing. Uh, Point forecast to obtain uh, to to obtain a uh, probability forecast, uh, and uh, some of the others include include, for instance, conformal prediction. So that's just which is also very popular in, 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 in among some researchers. Now maybe I won't skip this, but uh, when you have a number of predictors which is which is large. Uh, there may be some issues with quantum regression. You you could you could reduce the dimensionality of the problem by using principal components analysis. That's one of the one of the ways to do it. Or at another kind of tricky way is you when you include a lasso type penalty. So this guy here is is exactly as the lasso penalty we have seen before. So we penalize for a large number of not really important regressors and we remove them from the model. So eventually from all those all those regressors, so all those forecasts from different models or from the same model on different calibration windows, uh, you may select only this one and maybe somewhere here, and that's it, uh, depending on the choice of the parameter lambda here. So this 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 is method also improves the uh, the original the original approach. Now a different way of uh, obtaining probabilistic forecasts is to use a distributional neural net. Now the distributional neural net, what it does, it does not output the price itself, so it's not P at some point, so it's P, P D1, uh, but we return the parameters of a distribution that represents this 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 price at the, for the D at our one. If, if it's Gaussian, then it's the mu and sigma. If it's uh, more parameters, then you may have probably location scale, uh, skewness and and kurtosis that's the typical set and to to our surprise this actually has this actually has has a, has a huge potential it was i was expecting an improvement but not such an improvement so you can see um it's between 15 and 20 percent even uh, improvement over the last of this lear type models here so so this is this is this is a real, real a lot uh, but again, you obtain it at a much higher computational cost, and you have to use you have to use com forecast combination because this individual axes here uh, identify individual neural nets, but the results can be very variable, as you can see here. Also here, uh, this is for for the normal distribution that that output that this output uh, in, in the network or JSU. So this is a four parameter distribution. But if you combine them, you get a you get at this level this 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 one here, which is much much uh, better. So four four neural nets are are estimated, and then these four runs of the neural net are just combined, just because of the variability of results that you obtain. Of course, four is just an arbitrary number. You could use any number, but that's 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 uh, in general a few to to get um, uh, to improve your forecast. Now, so while uh, the CRPS so this was measured as the as the pinball loss across 99 percentiles. We would expect that it would be greener if if we go down here and we use the distribution on neural nets. Uh, but we didn't expect also the the errors themselves, the point forecasting errors, to generally not be bad at least at least in this here in the MAE case uh, for these models. So so this was this was a surprise to us. Uh, so they these models not only give you a good predictive performance in terms of the distribution, but also 
the mean of this distribution is is better than a model which is just trained to 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 give you the mean of the distribution. Uh, Mm, okay, working with intraday contracts. Now the question is, how do you you have a model? And I mean, to build a model for a trajectory, you need not only the distribution. So like uh, uh, this 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 flowchart is from our recent working paper, where you either use uh, use some method like the distribution deep neural net to provide you the distribution of the given moments in time. Or you can use a two-step version where you use for first last of estimated regression and then quantity regression or any any other point forecasting model plus something to plus something to obtain the predicted distributions. And then you need to somehow catch the, the, the interdependence. And one of the most standard ways to do it in, in, in statistics is to use a copula, uh, which which catches the dependence between the different distributions at different moments in time. Uh, and this can be used to to create a trajectory which has the right temporal structure, not just not just uh, the correct marginal distribution. Uh, and as a final step, I guess I have maybe like five minutes more. Uh, I would like to move into financial evaluations, which is which is something that has not been very popular over the years, but it, it is becoming popular. So we would like to not only get the forecast, is it a point forecast, is it, is it a interval forecast, a distribution or, or trajectory forecast, but also see if this improved forecast, with, which may be statistically significant, yeah, that, that, that's what is interesting. I mean, it, it may be statistically significant different, they are, they are much better, but using them not necessarily gives you higher profits. So uh, in the recent years, what people have been doing who have been uh, apart from reporting what are the standard error measures, also reporting the results of you running some strategies. And for instance, you could have a you could have a strategy with prediction uh, with using prediction intervals, so probabilistic forecasts. You can uh, try to maximize your profits, but by also using the prediction bidding, uh, have setting a limit order at the at the limit price, not not just the point forecast, which is which is somewhere here. Uh, so when you bid in the day ahead market uh, and you and you try to find the, the let's say the lowest and the highest moments so where you can buy you can buy electricity, let's say charge your battery and then discharge it and sell electricity. Uh, you can try to predict which is the highest and lowest price, but of course the prediction intervals will give you the likelihood of the price actually being in this range. So if if the if the prediction interval is very wide, it may turn out that the, there's a risk that the price for this hour will be very low and you won't make money actually or, or you can lose money. So using the prediction intervals, we can improve our result. And uh, in this paper, uh, we we show that essentially that irrespective of what kind of uh, probabilistic models we are using, all these models gave much, much better profit, higher profits than, than, than this very similar strategy based just on point forecasts. So using probabilistic, using probabilistic uh, forecasts is, can be benef beneficial. Uh, and the final part, I oh know this is blinking again. Uh, okay, the idea here was the prediction. Okay, so the, you, you, we generate the trajectories of prices. And this is important for, for the intraday markets with continuous trading where you have the whole trajectory and you should try to, to, to fit the, the moment where, where you should trade. Now, what we, are, what we are suggesting in this paper and extending it recently is the use prediction band. So this is this, this red curve, uh, which is uh, the, the red one here, is, is a red curve that let's say 75% uh, of whole trajectories are below it. So it's not a, it's not it does not catch margin at, at each point in time, but it catches the whole trajectory because we want to find the model, uh, we want to find the the best trading moment, let's say the highest price if you are selling, the lowest if you are buying, uh, to 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 make the to make the transaction in the market. So for instance, uh, we have here the prediction band uh, estimated. Uh, this is the red curve. The the blue the, the green one is the kind of exposed known real price. 
So we, we are at this moment in time, we place a, a, a bit into the a limit order in, into, the, into the exchange that we will sell at this price, uh, uh, the price equal to this, to this prediction band. Uh, and if the price is lower, in this case, the green is lower, so it's not accepted, we, 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 we do it again, we do it again, and then we, with, with, this, with this price, the actual price in this time period, in this 15 minute window, crosses the, the red curve. So this is the tra this transaction is accepted, and this is this is when we make we 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 sell we sell the price. So this kind of strategy uh, can can uh, help you in deciding in w at which moment in time to make a tra transaction in an in continuous time into the market. And then we, in the show in the paper we also show that this actually this actually uh, depending on different decisions not a huge change but it's roughly one euro per megawatt compared to a naive strategy which you just, you just trade uh, you just trade at the last moment in the in, 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 in continuous time trading for a given for a given product so uh, and you can even also decompose which elements of the model gives you gives you the benefit really better results than than than, than just a naive strategy uh, using neural nets, the distribution of neural nets, you can still go higher here. This is interesting and you can improve it because the probabilistic forecasts from the neural net are actually higher and uh, are better. And you, this actually gives you an advantage and, and you can increase increase your trading profits from, from, from this. OK, uh, I guess uh, yeah, this, that, that's more or less it, what, I, what I wanted to tell you about. Uh, I covered the different topics listed here in the agenda. And uh, just for your information, let's say if you go to my web page, which is also on the first slide, uh, it's also here. The, the publications I've been mentioning are are here, uh, available here from my from my website. If you have any problems with them, with accessing some of them, send me an email. Uh, there's also you can you can have a look at the web pages of my two projects uh, currently running. One is a CrossFit project. Uh, and one is priority, which is just started with with learning seal from from Essen, uh, which we will look into the mid and long term price forecasting of this markets, a topic that was not developed for many many years and very unpopular, let's say, in the in the literature. Uh, so keep uh, so uh, so yeah, have a look from time to time on the project webpage to see some of the interesting stuff that we'll be developing here. Okay, thank you very much. Brilliant, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, We've got some questions already coming in the chat and I'll read those through. But yeah, if anyone else has any other questions, add them in. Um, we've got one question from Clemis who asks, uh, hello, Professor Warren. I would like to ask you the pros and cons of the quantile regression averaging and how this technique behaves in very short term and long term electricity price forecasting. Uh, OK. We haven't uh, looked too much into a long term, as I said. I mean, we are we have just started doing it, so I don't have I don't have the, um, the any results to, to share with you. Uh, for very short term, it does it does work well. I mean, and actually in this paper, let me show this one here. We are using quantile regression, so so this is this is also quantile regression uh, here, and it and it works well. I mean, you can do better. If you have distribution neural net which provides better better quality forecast, but it is it it it, it works well in the short term. Can I ask like a follow on to that? Then uh, I guess you analyze the literature. Have you got any thoughts on, um, you know, the, how many of these papers or what proportion are sort of in the probabilistic area? Um, I mean, this is, has been increasing in, I mean, since I think the Global Energy Forecasting Competition 2014 and the, there was a special edition in IJF 2016, I think since then it has become more popular, at least in price forecasting, uh, but it's still a minority. I would guess less than 20% are, are about probabilistic forecasting. Are you aware of how much of this might be then being applied operationally yet, or is it sort of still very early stages? Uh, that's hard, hard to assess. I mean, uh, I, I am in contact with some, a few companies and we are discussing, I mean, testing some of the, of the methods that we've been developing, uh, but I have no idea how wide this is, uh, how spread. So, uh, well, if any of, of, of the participants of this would be willing to, to test some of the ideas, then, then I will be more than happy to, to help you out with this and, and to see what is actual the, in practice, how well that do they, do they perform? Thank you very much. 
Um, we've got a question from Timothy uh, who asks, to what extent can those methods you've, you've presented today be transferred to real time continuous intraday price forecasting? Uh, OK, I guess the question was asked a bit before that I was talking about it, but but uh, yes, th this is what can be done. So uh, so actually uh, the methods that OK, maybe it's better on the flowchart here. I have no idea why this <laughs> this is blinking. I don't know if you also see it blinking or just me. Uh, it's a little bit, yeah. I tip. I typically use use Zoom, not 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 uh, Teams. And for some reason, it seems that uh, that Teams is just making a problem here. Okay, without it, it's better. Uh, okay, so uh, the methods the methods work. I mean, it's uh, it's. Uh, I mean, the same method. So the same method in the sense. That this is also lasso estimated regression model. It's also quantity regression. Of course, you have to adapt it to to what exactly you want. How how uh, how what, uh, sorry. What are the time step of the, of the of the path that you are generating? So it cannot be every second. I mean, just that will be too complex. Uh, because if you want to catch the 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 dependence, the temporal dependence between the distributions of prices at the different moments in time. If it's a hundred or more, the copula will have a problem with it. So, so what we have been doing here, we've been kind of splitting the the, the last three hours of trading into fifteen minute intervals, and then you have ten, twelve, depending on how 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 exact how many what we want to trade, and uh, and then this is feasible, and then this is work. So, like twenty four would, would still be okay because for twenty four we we've been doing it for the day ahead market, but in the intraday, yes, you can split into shorter time intervals. Maybe five minute intervals would be still still feasible. So it's just three more times more. So the same method after adapting them from let's say of the set, so the let's say the the inputs, the features of the model can be different and in general will be different, uh, but the machinery inside is similar. Thank you. I've kind of got an extension to this. So it seems then there's certain areas where you said there isn't been so much focus, sort of, you know, the, the intraday and the balancing, for instance. I'm just wondering, like, is there areas of forecasting or sort of data analytics here where there's sort of a there's some opportunities, um, you know, other market products, for instance, where you think there needs to be more research or there's there's definitely some low hanging fruit or or even like, you know, um, something that the research community needs to look at. Um, I mean, OK, from an academic perspective, the thing is that it's the data is most important. Access to data is most important. I mean, the day had prices are relatively easily available. With day to day, it's more tricky. And I mean, if you start working with uh, price trajectories, you have transaction data. It's tons of data. It's, I mean, you are entering essentially big data area. Uh, uh, it's not freely available. You have you have to well, you have to pay for access to it. So that's that's big. That's I think it's an obstacle for the academic world. So for kind of an uptake of this of this topic, uh, I think this is a major issue. Uh, imbalance data again. This is it, it's essentially the data availability. If if data for all these things would be available, I guess the researchers would would look into it. And if it's if it's a uh, big trouble to get the data, then then there's not, not don't don't see too much of research in this area. Thank you. There's a few more questions that popped up. So Connor asks, what kind of compute resources do some of the more exotic models you discuss need? Reasonable to run locally, or is the cloud typically needed? Uh, okay. Uh, if okay, we, apart from the deep neural nets, uh, you don't really need a cloud. I mean, it, even even the deep, deep neural nets you can do on a local workstation. I mean, like I don't know, 30, 32 processor machine would be okay. You don't need the cloud to do it. Uh, so it's not a huge. You, uh, actually, what is interesting initially, we we also <laughs> invested in some computers with graphics cards, and some of these problems are just not well suited for the graphics cards. It seems, for instance, the DNN doesn't really the distribution DNN didn't really require it. I mean, they didn't speed up the process much. So uh, multi multi processors, yes, because you can split the tasks, but you don't need the cloud to do it. So so it's kind of a, a medium sized problem, I would say. Thank you. Um, can I ask for a clarification? Uh, with the probabilistic forecast, um, it originates from the model stack. Is this correct? I.e., training on different calibration periods. I guess that was one of your one of your forecasts, at least. Uh, the probabilistic forecast. No, probabilistic. It okay. The one one way of looking at it is is like with quantum regression, uh, quantum regression averaging here, that. Uh, 
it just we start from point forecast. So you can have you can have point forecast from any model essentially, uh, and uh, and uh, what quantum regression does it can allows you to transform this into a probabilistic forecast, into a quantile forecast. Now, a similar idea is to use conformal prediction, where you can you can you can do the same. And there is also isotonic distribution regression. There are a few statistical tools which allow you to kind of con convert from from point forecast, from point forecast of the price to the quantiles of the price. Uh, so so there's no uh, yeah that is, this this is it. And and that the three I mean the two most popular ones I would say are quantile regression and and conformal prediction. It kind of surprises me in some ways that you get a good quantile regression from using points, because obviously each point one is going to probably be kind of a centralized value, right? Uh, yeah, but but since okay, none none of the none of the models are perfect. They have, there is some variability in how they behave, and uh, this variability is enough to give you some uncertainty about the uh, about the actual distribution, so the context of the distribution. So I mean, this was actually a surprise. I mean, when. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, 2013, probably my former PhD student, uh, Jakub Nowotowski, came over with, with the idea of this. I didn't believe it would be really good. So I said, but OK, yeah. that's what you tell the students <laughs> to do. OK, try it. He came with the results and they were astonishing. I was just surprised how well it does. Actually, we never again got as good results as, as on for that data that we used, used back then. But still, it, it's really good. So it 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 is it does really work. That's interesting. A um, couple more questions here. Um, and we have Sven who asks, uh, which data except the typical, i.e. market weather and load, can you recommend? So yeah, do you have any, uh, do you have an expert tip? Uh, well, OK, in in the research papers, you won't see much more. I mean, you will see only the, the, ex, the exogenous variables which are publicly available, so like the NSOE, let's say, website or something like this. So it's, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, if you are uh into forecasting for local more local market they guess local uh, data would be important as uh, perhaps some also more weather data let's say weather forecast data for intraday trading definitely updates of weather forecasts are important because for day ahead i mean you make a bid in the morning of today and you well it, that's it essentially uh, so use the data at one point, but with 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 continuous trading, you can update your data, and this is really important. Uh, that the updates of the data have been shown. I think there are two papers already on this. That if you update those weather information data, you get you get better forecast in the uh, continuous trading markets. But otherwise, if it's I mean if it's some local market, you can use it. But then, uh, okay, the price in the end is the is the marginal fuel. I mean, the one that 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 that, that is the highest, uh, the, the most expensive, let's say, at a given moment in time. So depending on the market, it may be maybe coal, maybe gas. Uh, the question is which which is the marginal fuel at the time. So using this information can also uh, be important, and per, perhaps using just how much how much is the share of uh, generation from renewables and uh, from conventional power this also is important uh, so 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 these variables can can be helpful yeah and i guess ensemble forecasts of weather would be useful and i guess that brings me on to flora's question which answers uh, asks about the these ensemble forecasts of, of spot power based on weather scenarios are known to be biased so is there a practical way to recalibrate these ensembles and path forecasts uh, I've had a discussion with it on this uh, with a colleague, Sebastian uh, from Alert from from Karlsruhe recently when he was visiting our place. Yeah, you can you can do it. You can actually help. Uh, you can kind of post process the the forecast to improve to improve their uh, their 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 value or their their fit. The, the, so so this is this is this is possible. I think if you are into weather forecasting, look have a look at Tillman Gnighting's papers or or Sebastian Lers. They have a few pay recent papers on how this can be done. So that's that's uh, something to to be looking. Brilliant. Uh, I think we'll just do the last question and then uh, we'll wrap up. Uh, Karen asks, what are the benefits of multivariate over univariate models, and how does it generally affect the performance? Okay, with simpler models, uh, the 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 univariate you build one big model for all time moments in the or let's say twenty four hours of the next day essentially. Uh, some people just like to have the, the work with this, but then you have one model when you have usually more 
parameters to estimate. If you don't use regularization, you may get into problems with estimating the parameter, the correct estimation of these parameters. There may be a lot of noise in this estimation. So this multivariate setting where you have the separate hours for a separate model for each hour, they are more parsimonious and you will have fewer, fewer problems with this. But if you use regularization, uh, on both setups, you will get more or less the same results. So, so, so you will eliminate the, 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 the features which are not really needed and, and uh, it, it will give you more or less the same results. And this is one of the results of our paper that I was discussing earlier. Um, brilliant. OK, thank you very much. That was brilliant. Um, so um, I'm just going to uh, wrap up now. So I want to thank you very much, Rafael uh, Ferrand, for a brilliant talk. Really interesting. Um, we will be sharing. Obviously, we've got a video I just, sharing. I, sorry, I just I just posted the, the name of the author for post-processing of ensemble ah, yeah. Tillman Knight. Uh, and there's also Tillman Knight yeah, that you mentioned also, yes, as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, yes, yeah, so yeah, thank you very much. It was a brilliant talk, very interesting. Um, uh, Rafael said he's happy to take further questions after this. You want to email, um, and also, uh, you know, we'll be sharing the slides and we'll be we'll be sharing the the recording as well. So um, I just want to thank you very much, uh, Rafael. It's been really interesting. It's the last to, uh, seminar of our year as well, so nice one to wrap up on. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, Thanks. And yeah, the names are in the chat as well. So yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And uh, we'll be in contact soon as, as well, Raffle, anyway. So, and uh, we'll catch up. So, really, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Bye.